Okay, UK Ultimate Seminar, thanks for having us. My name is Sean Prez. I am the CEO and founder of Power Moves Inc., which is a grassroots um, and alternative marketing and promotion agency. I am also the founder and CEO of the Global Spin Awards, which is the Grammys for the DJs. It is my pleasure to be here, and it's also my pleasure to bring some of my peers and people I look up to in the music industry here in the US. First, I'd like to introduce Mr. Bob Celestin to the panel. Bob, can you give us a brief, uh, just history of your background, what you do, who you are, and why you are on the Ultimate Seminars panel? Well, first and foremost, man, good to talk to you and see you again, Sean, it's been a minute. Absolutely. Um, also, thanks to Kwame and Nicola and Andrea for inviting me. This is really, really exciting. And me and Kwame, go back uh, a very long time um, when, when CDs were still being uh, sold. That, that's how far back we go. Anyway, um, my name is Bob Celestin. I'm an entertainment attorney. I'm based here in New York City. Uh, I've been practicing for about 30 years now. Um, I got my start working at Arista Records in their legal department, then went to work with Andre Harrell at, and Puffy at Uptown Records, where we signed Jodeci, Mary J. Blige, Heavy D, Guy, et cetera, et cetera. I uh, was out on my own uh, for a minute, went, and then I ended up working with Louise West, where we collectively represented Genuine, Timbaland, and Missy Elliott. I've been on my own since 2000. I was a co-manager of a group called City High that came out in the late 90s, did really well, really uh, aligned with the Wyclef and Jimmy Iovine. And since 2000, I've been practicing on my own. I've represented uh, folks like P.D. Pablo, 3LW, to some of the new school um, rappers, such as uh, Designer, um, the late XXX Tentacion, the late Pop Smoke, uh, Takashi 69 and others. And it's been a great time to be in the music business right now. It's popping. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Um, our next panelist is, uh, you know, this is somebody I have been knowing almost my entire time at Bad Boy. Actually, my entire time at Bad Boy. And I didn't give that background um, part of me, but I am a Bad Boy alumni and it would be uh, remiss if I did not bring people who I love, respect, and honor um, their opinions, not just as music executives, but as entrepreneurs. So next to the panel, Miss Marilyn Van Alstein. Marilyn, what up? Hello, how are you guys? <laughs> um, I'll give a little bit of background um, on myself. I started many moons ago as an intern at Bad Boy and uh, kind of worked the corporate ladder up to, I think I left as a senior VP of um, operations and uh, branded, branded entertainment. Um, I left in 2014 and launched my own lifestyle uh, slash management agency, which is called MB Management Group, where I took on clients such as Ciroc, uh, De Leon, um, Rapsnex, uh, Mona Scott Young, um, and then I've been doing that for a couple of years now. And uh, last year I decided to launch a wine brand. Uh, so incoming uh, was Wifey Brands, uh, where me and my partner have launched a rosé and a sweet cuvee sparkling wine that's uh, imported from Italy out to the US. Um, and that's a little bit on my background. Thanks, Marilyn. No problem. Another former peer, colleague, and dear friend of mine I wanted to bring onto this panel because he is not only someone I've worked very closely with over the years, but he is a fellow respected entrepreneur. Uh, and he's a guy who stepped up and took my place in the first, uh, what is that, the, the, the first season of Making the Band. Please welcome Mr. Jason Wiley to the panel. Uh, thank you, Prez. I mean, the, the greatest thing about taking Prez's position and making the band, this is just a little unknown fact, is because Prez decided he didn't want to go meet MTV, I met my wife. So I always will always thank Prez for deciding he didn't want to do this anymore and said I had to. I was an intern at the time, and so I didn't have no choice. I would have probably said no, too, but that's that's another story. So I'm Jason Wiley. I uh, started out at Bad Boy uh, as an intern, similar to Marilyn. Uh, that's where I, uh, I first met Marilyn and Prez. Um, actually, I think I met Bob at that time as well. 
uh, worked my way up through there, went over to Jive Records for a little bit, um, and returned to Bad Boy to finish my career kind of in music as, uh, I think, a VP of marketing when I left there. I left to start an agency, but uh, quickly went to the Sixers and was head of um, entertainment and content there uh, for a couple of years. And then I returned back to New York, uh, the Philadelphia 76ers in Philadelphia NBA basketball team. And then I uh, returned to New York City and um, became a partner at uh, the TID agency, This Is Dope, um, where we focus on experiential marketing and, and PR services. Um, and so I've been here for four years now. Uh, we have have clients such as AT&T, Crown Royal, Toyota, um, uh, McDonald's, uh, and a variety of other things. Um, so uh, that's where I am now and here. And I'm, I'm here at the panel uh, because I think it's important for at this time for us to kind of get together and, and be able to uh, provide information, network, give resources, and, and figure out ways to, to expand and grow during these crazy times. Thank you, Jason. Guys, panelists, uh, there's a lot of information and I am really big on giving back and providing much information as humanly possible. So I'm gonna, we got a lot to go over in a very short amount of time. So let's keep our answers relatively brief, but detailed. Uh, you know, listening to all of you guys intro, we all, and I, and I include us all, we all have something in common. Obviously we have a, a a reverence and, and, and a love for the music industry, but we have set out onto different paths of entrepreneurship. I think that we live in a world now, whereas everybody wants to be a boss. Everybody wants to be their own boss. Nobody wants to be a worker anymore. But listening to all of you guys intro, you all talked about your starts. Marilyn, starting with you, can you talk to this panel just about the importance of learning uh, on any level, whether it's interning, whether it's working as an assistant, the goal is always to get in the door, but most people want to start at the top and they don't see the, the value in starting at the bottom and working their way up. Yeah, sure. So um, I started many moons ago <laughs> as a very young intern. And I think when, I realized the different facets of the music industry and just a music company in general, I started to maneuver my way around the company. So as you know, Fred, I worked in damn near every position in every department at uh, the Sean Combs various companies. Um, as he grew, I hopped around, tried different things. And I think that helped me a lot for entrepreneurism. Um, primarily because when you go out on your own, you are your own IT person, you are your own finance person, you're your own marketer, your own digital marketer, everything that you know, you're know you used to having these different departments to go to for, you become that one-stop shop. And I think that um, because I was able to work under Sean Combs, I was able to learn the different, learn about business from different departments in different areas. Um, and that kind of helped me uh, launch into the businesses that I have now. Thank you, Bob. Why don't you um, give us your insight and your thought on working your way up, working under somebody who is proven, somebody who has their foot in the game, have a stronghold in learning before jumping out on your own? Hey, I listen, especially for young attorneys, I tell this all the time because Again, when you're a young attorney, you're trying to get into the game, you really, it, it's very valuable to seek as many internships as possible. Um, and even if you're not an attorney, you're trying to get into the game, internships are valuable. But more importantly, someone once told me that uh, a, a real good little slogan, in order to be a great leader, you have to be first a follower, right? So it doesn't hurt to pay your dues by working with someone preferably in the industry you'd like to get involved in. Um, and, and, and once you get that opportunity, whether it's paid or unpaid, the other thing is to give it 150%, right? Uh, a lot of times, let's say, you know, you, the, the, the time that you have to be at the internship is let's say 12 to five. Well, shoot, if you get there at 11 o'clock and you're waiting for, for, for your boss to show up or you're there after five o'clock, six, seven o'clock doing whatever needs to be done, that's going to, really, really give your, your, your boss a, a real different 
view so that when an opportunity presents itself, you're the first in line, right? Too many times I find that there are interns like, oh, if I'm not getting paid, I'm not doing this, or, oh, I'm only getting paid to, for four hours. So it doesn't matter what I'm working on. When, when the four hour clock ticks, I'm out. That's really, really a, sort of a, a very negative attitude to have. And ultimately at the end of the day, don't be surprised if someone else that, that came in right you know, after you get that position. Why? Because they're willing to work a little harder and sacrifice a little bit more. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Jason, I, I want to pivot on the question just a little bit. You know, yes, I think that we all have to work our way up from, from the ground and we have to learn. But then there comes that day when it is time for you to set out on your own. Can you talk to me just in your opinion, you're a guy who worked as an executive in the music industry for many years before you set out on your own. Can you just talk to me about the mindset of what it takes to daring to, to dare to be great? And what I mean by that is it's one thing to get a check every week and know that check is going to be there. It's going to be deposited. But there's a whole other thing to, to jump into the mindset of I literally have to eat what I kill but you have to first dare to be great. Well, I, 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 one, I, I want to kind of the dare to be great kind of statement, if I can. Um, I have a lot of friends who will never be entrepreneurs, but they might be CEOs of the companies that they're in, right? Um, and, and they're, they're going to be completely great. Everyone is not, is not made to be an entrepreneur and everyone's not made to kind of climb the ladder at their corporation to hopefully one day become president or CEO of that company. Um, but, but both are, are great paths and you can do amazing things in, in both avenues. I think, I think for entrepreneurs, though, it does come a point in time where you have an idea and you have something that you want to grow. You have a seed that you feel is, is, is inside of you that you need to see come to life, that you need to be a part of. And the thing about entrepreneurship is that you are constantly working. So people who think like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm going to be a boss and like I get to, I know you, you like every entrepreneur I know, you can call them at any point in time and they are working. Like, you know, they have a lot of family issues because people are always questioning why they got to work so much and, and what's going on because your mind, you're not focused on one thing. When you work for a corporation, you're inside of a vertical and you're focused on that one vertical and how to accomplish that vertical, whatever that is. When you're an entrepreneur, you're thinking about the finances, you're thinking about the sales, you're thinking about how you're going to make payroll, what are you going to do um, if a client walks away? How do you keep a client? How do you make sure that the clients are happy? How are you going to get new clients? What is the job doing the, the follow up, the follow through and all of those things are constantly going through your head. So you're always thinking about things or working or something or waking up in the middle of the night, writing something down because an idea came to you of what you need to do first thing in the morning when you get up you're emailing someone at four in the morning because that idea struck I mean it, it, it becomes really difficult if you don't have the mindset of the continuation of it right because you always have to be thinking 10 steps ahead in order to maintain your business and ensure growth um, otherwise you're going to fail or, or, or fall um, but when you're at a corporation or a company you don't necessarily have to be thinking that way um, but it doesn't mean you won't be great. I want to just make sure it, it just means, you know, a different mindset, like you said, Prez. Um, and and I think entrepreneurs kind of collectively, we all have that mindset of we want to see something really grow that we feel really strongly about and passionate about. Yeah, excellent answer, Jason. Uh, you know, Marilyn, I want to swing on over to you. I know you started your business when 2016 or 2014? Uh, 2015, the first one, 2015. 2015. Okay. 2015. <laughs> okay. So, so you're, you're full-time entrepreneur for roughly five years. One of the things that holds most people back from becoming a full-time entrepreneur is fear. They, they are literally scared to death as much as they want to set out on their own. They're literally scared to death about going out there and betting on themselves. Can you talk to us 
just about how you dealt with fear in the beginning, how you deal with it now, because business is up and down. COVID-19 is, COVID is ravaging our, our world as we know it. And what are some strategies that some aspiring entrepreneurs can use to overcome fear? Um, I think the first thing I would say is success lies at the end of fear. So you have to like, you have to get through that to, to accomplish anything. Um, when I left uh, Bad Boy in uh, 2014, um, you know, I left a pretty decent job. I think I did like 19 years. <laughs> um, and then I woke up the first week of January and I remember feeling like, wait, I don't have anywhere to go because you become conditioned. You know, you're going into the office every day. You have things to do. Um, it was all on me. And I was out, to be honest, for the first three days, I cried my eyes out because I just didn't know what to do, where to go or whatever. Um, but then I was like, these bills are not going to get paid with these tears. So I had to get up. I, I, I allowed myself a week to adjust to this new life that I created for myself. And um, I got up and I got to it. I put one foot in front of the other. And honestly, I just never stopped. Um, I think with another thing with fear is I, the things that I'm trying to do, I compete with myself. So I'm only trying to better myself. I don't look at anyone else. I don't look in anyone else's lane to see what anyone else is doing. I'm competing with myself. So I'm continuously trying to improve okay, I, I got this win last year. I landed this big client last year. How do I land a bigger client this year? And I think if you stay focused more on your goals and you kind of put one foot in front of the other, I think that you could, you get through whatever discouragement, whatever fear you're feeling, you get through it. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, you're, you're absolutely right. There is a, it, it, in addition to the tangible, there is, a psychological aspect uh, to going out and doing things on your own, eating what you kill, earning your own paycheck. Bob, I want to move it on over to you for a second. Again, we're talking to people who want to be in the music industry and we're also talking to people who, uh, you know, they want to be an entrepreneurs. Can you talk about some of the early years uh, problems that you faced in what are some of the most common problems that any entrepreneur is going that's going to any entrepreneur is going to find themselves facing? Well, I can tell you, man. First of all, let me just go back to for a second to what Jason was saying about you know the, the challenges of 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 an entrepreneur. Um, more importantly, you have to be able to make sacrifices, right? And a lot of times, your relationships are going to suffer, right? So. You know, if you've got a boyfriend or a girlfriend, if they're not super supportive and understand of what you're trying to do, that's going to suffer because your your goal, whether it's a business you're trying to create or your your art or whatever the case may be, tends to be your your boyfriend or girlfriend or should be anyway. Um, and then when you have children, you know, if you have children, it, that's a whole different, you know, uh, issue that you got to be concerned about. Uh, balancing what's best for your child versus what you want. So again, if you've got a, a great support mechanism, that's going to be a good thing. So in terms of going back to your question, Sean, um, the biggest challenge for me had to do with technology and the shift in your business. So, you know, I, I grew up uh, in the, the golden age of the 90s, as we all did, and the music industry was popping. Um, and then, you know, this kid who had nothing better to do than to mess around with some software, this kid named Sean Fanning creates Napster. So Napster in 1999, 2000, really, really decimated the business. And from my perspective as an attorney, who's primarily an artist advocate, man, when I tell you that one day the phones are ringing, a week later, this, web, web, this uh, software um, uh, gets created, maybe about a month later, the phone stopped ringing because record labels are losing money. Um, uh, they're not signing artists. Uh, nobody's buying records. And man, when you talk about really just, you know, a sea change in the business, sort of like what people are going through with the pandemic. It's almost like, you know, uh, 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 the pandemic was 20 years or 20 years earlier, right? For the new, for the music business. 
it really, really, really tested and challenged uh, me in a lot of different ways. Um, but I had been, you know, my mindset at the time, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a child of, of Haitian immigrants and, you know, anything about Haitians, we're very, very prideful, or very, very kind of like arrogant to some degree. And we're like, listen, I'm a, I, I said, I work for, 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 for white men. Uh, I work for black men. I'm going to work for myself. Come hell or high water, this is going to have to work. And, you know, I've had to, had to make certain sacrifices. I prided myself on always being able to pay my assistant. Um, but a lot of things suffered. Um, and there, you ha I had to have a lot of faith. I'm like, you know what? This is, this is going to turn around. This is going to, this is going to get better. This is going to get better. Um, had great support people around me who were like, listen, don't give up. And then, you know, uh, uh, Steve Jobs creates iTunes and that kind of stemmed to some degree that the, the tide of piracy. And then a few years later, you got Daniel Eck creating Spotify. And when I tell you that Spotify, you know, at Apple and all this streaming has been a revelation. Um, it's, it's really, uh, uh, almost an understatement when I say that. So I always like to make the joke that it was technology that almost destroyed the business. Now it's technology that's bringing back the business. Um, because despite the pandemic and the lack of touring on, on the streaming side, on the music side, the record industry is doing very, very well. Um, the artists that I represent and even some up and coming artists that, you know, the, 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 the type of deals are usually high six figures or high seven figure deals. I mean, really life-changing type of deal. So, um, you know, to those who are going through some hard times, you, you really you really have to kind of like have a, a certain faith. And then the other thing too is to diversify. So I try to learn about real estate investing. I learn about, uh, I, I do a lot of stock investing. I learn about trying to create online courses. There are other different ways that you can kind of like try to figure out other streams of income that are coming in to kind of hold you over until things get back on point. Thank you, Bob. Bob, you touched on uh, kind of a segue topic I want to go to. You said that, um, you know, in becoming an entrepreneur, you're going to be tested, especially your relationships. And I want to shift this over to you, Marilyn, because you are known for having established really, really good relationships over the years. And I'm a firm believer. It's very cliche, but, it, it, you know, it's true. Your net worth comes down to your net work. Can you talk to us, Marilyn, about the, the importance of establishing a great network and just really uh, establishing great relationships? Yeah, sure. Um, well, in my professional life, I have, um, to your point, I've established some great relationships with um, some power plays in the entertainment industry. Um, but I am a, an advocate for people establishing relationships no matter who the person is. So a lot of my business comes from, it can come from a brand manager sitting at a label, you know, it can come from an assistant sitting at a law firm, you know, you just never know where your business is coming from. So I think it's important for you to have a range of contacts, not just like heavy hitters, but some of the people that are just to get in their career started, um, you know, I mentor a lot of females uh, stateside um, that need advice, whether, you know, how they're moving up in the world. Um, so I believe that, I believe that if you have a range of contacts and a, a range of people in your network, you have a strong net worth. <laughs> and your business, a lot of my business comes from uh, referrals, just simple referrals. I don't go out and pitch to anyone. I don't ask, you know, I, I don't, do presentations to anyone. A lot of that that business that I have gotten over the years have come from referrals of, it could be anybody, literally. Uh, an assistant, it could be a coordinator, it could be a CEO at a large company. And I've benefited from maintaining those relationships. Thank you, Marilyn. Jason, moving it over to you. Marilyn just talked about maintaining relationships, but that's not the easiest thing to do. What, what are the best strategies? What are the best ways that, you know, people looking to get into the music industry, people looking to become entrepreneurs, what are the best ways for them once they make a connection? How do you maintain it? Well, first, I want to say Marilyn is not even not even fully giving all of the details of how she works to maintain relationships. She she is connected to people all over. And I think the, the important thing that she talked about was right. Um, 
it's not about a certain level of a position. It's about maintaining respect and communication with everyone from the top to the bottom. I think, I think a very important thing that I learned while I was a bad boy was that Puff would go around and he would ask uh, interns questions as well as the other executives, right? And an intern could get their idea put forward just as quickly as another executive if it was the best idea. And what that taught me is, right, you can't limit yourself on who you're talking to or what you're talking about because like as, as we all grow in our professions, you kind of lose touch with some of the grassroots things that are going on. And so you need people around you to always help you stay connected in a variety of ways. And I think maintaining those relationships is, 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 is about keeping lines of communication open, right? It is important to not only hit people when you need them, but to reach out and see what's going on. When people have something going on in their life, say, you know, especially with social media, with all the things happening, uh, happy birthday, congratulations, heard about the promotion, heard about the new client. That's amazing. Keep it going. Um, when things, when people have um, things going on that, that they're hurting about, you know, reaching out to see if they need anything. Um, it's about, it's about communication and communication is a, a two-way dialogue. So it shouldn't be I hit Prez up because I need him to do something for me and think that, oh, that's we, we have a great lines of communication when I'm only contacting Prez when I need something. Right. I'm never contacting Prez to just say, hey, what's going on? How are you? How's the family? Oh, it's the holiday. I mean, just send a holiday message. Right. Uh, holidays come just Merry Christmas. Like you would be surprised how far that goes with people knowing that at least you you reached out to them. I mean, one one of the radio guys used to tell me he he spent two hours. He blocked out two hours every Friday just to hit people. Right. Like and I'm, I'm like, come on, man, you can't you can't be serious. He like, yo, these it's more important for me to have a relationship with people than 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 like I don't get my job done. So he blocked out two hours and every Friday he would randomly hit people within his network just to check on them. Right. And if, if someone responded back, he would allow for time to go back and forth. But it was important to maintain these relationships, even though he had a vast um, network. Right. He just blocked out two hours at least a week where he was. That was a part of the job, hitting people up to just see how they were doing and not asking for anything. And, and in turn, when he really did need something, he, he always said, you know, I got a response because they felt like, you know, our relationship was legitimate where if I needed something, it was I needed it. So I think it's important for people to block out time to to reach out to people and to to make sure that you are constantly knowing that you need to have a two-way dialogue with people to actually have a relationship. And so you need to be willing and able to help them as much as you would need them to help you. Thank you, Jay. Bob, you mentioned earlier, you, you, you talked about how uh, the, the illegal download and almost decimated the music industry in the late 90s, early 2000s. And you said it was important to diversify, uh, but, I, I, I feel that that is a major problem with young entrepreneurs. And what I mean by that is it's important to learn your craft first, become the best at what you do, become known and respected at your craft before diversifying. So I wanna swing it back to you. I know diversifying, it is a, necess a necessity, um, having one stream of income is just too close to having none. But right. you speak to somebody who is all over the place uh, and, and haven't yet solidified their name in one particular lane. Cool, so I'm gonna get to that question. I just wanted to just touch on something that, that Jason and Marilyn were talking about, especially Marilyn was saying uh, about relationships, right? Uh, and referrals, getting referrals. A lot of my business is through referrals. So a couple quick things. One is to all those artists and entrepreneurs and out there, it's like, you know, be try to keep your word at all times, right? That's one of the biggest issues that, you know, a lot of, you know, people that are trying to do business, 
is you're going to say you're going to do this. You're going to call on something such a time. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And then you never do it. Or it's always an excuse. Right. I always tell people, you know, under promise and over deliver. Right. Because if you give people um, the impression that, wow, you know, you're giving them not the impression you're actually doing a lot more than you say you're going to do. And you're giving them much more value for whatever they're asking you to do. It's always going to, you know, keep you in good stead. Um, going back to the question, Sean, about diversification. Yeah, I mean, you know, when, when Napster hit, I was like, damn, like, all right, you know, clients aren't coming in. Well, you know, I consider myself a smart guy. So I'm like, okay, well, there, there are people right now in the pandemic that are making money, right? In the pandemic, they're making money. When this was happening with Napster, people were making money in the music business, or if not in the music business, take that back outside of the music business or things that were tangentially uh, connected to the music industry. Part of that is trying to be open-minded to learn. Now, obviously, you know, you can't be up at that, that, up to that point, I had like what, 15, 20 years of experience as an attorney. So that was my core. I spent a lot of time focusing on being the best attorney that I could be. So there's much to be said about trying to master your craft. But in terms of being an attorney, you know, it, it, it lends you to learning about other things. So, oh, okay, let me go see what I can learn about investing in the real estate. Um, I was always very curious. I mean, one of the things that unfortunately are people are kind of realizing that, you know, the world revolves around money. I mean, that's what it is. And so a lot of artists, especially, and, and people of color, we're not, you know, we're not raised in families that have a lot of money already. Or, you know, we, we got a rich uncle that, that's going to pass on and talk about hey, think about investing in the stock market, right? These are things that a lot of us just didn't have that advantage. But as you get older, you've got to understand like, look, there are people right now in the pandemic, businesses that are making money. There are investors making money. Not everybody is suffering. Why? The only difference is they have an education in whether it's financial education, uh, business education that, that some of us don't. So one of the things that I'm kind of encouraged about is to find that a lot of you know, artists, as well as, you know, folks that are just trying to, to, to figure out a way to, to maintain that they're expanding their knowledge base. They're trying to learn about um, the stock market, you know, learning about options, learning about investing. So, but I, I agree with you, Sean, in the very beginning, you can't be doing, you can't be, it was a, a jack of all trades and a master of none. You've got to find your core competency, try to become as good as possible in it, and then once you've got an, you've established a, a, a real strong core of knowledge and exp experience, slowly but surely try to diversify. Press, can I jump in real quick here on that? Because I think it's important what Please. you're what you're uh, stressing right now is that especially in music, right? People look at people like Jay Z, Puff. Uh, Dr. Dre, all these people will say, well, they, they do they do 50 different things and look how, right. how good they are. And I'm I'm a I'm I'm a I am i am ai am a writer, a beat maker, I run a label, I got a fashion line, I got I got this uh this liquor I'm about to put out. And you you always have to take them back and say, look at what they were first, not today. Right. First right. they were the, the they were an amazing music person. That's it. Nothing else. They right. weren't they weren't selling 50 million things. They became huge in music. And then from that, they built an empire. Right. So people always look at people look at, you know, uh, they look at Google today and not Google first. Google was a search engine. That's it. You just type, you search, nothing else. It didn't have YouTube. It didn't have everything, right? And then it grew. Facebook, when it started, it was only for college students to be able to understand who was on their campuses. That's it. Now it's the, it's the huge company that it is today. There needs to be growth. So when you're trying to be a, when you're trying to be this mogul, first own something. Own, own a piece of that mogulness that you're going to be and, 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 and work that out and be the best. So when somebody looks up your name, they say, oh, he, they the best at X, Y and Z. And then you can say, and I got 50 other different things going on. But don't especially, you know, one thing I, I do not like is when when I'm talking to people and they're trying to move up the ranks and they're trying to get things started. And the first thing they say to me, well, I do everything. 
well, then we can't. I mean, if you do everything, we can't talk because I don't know. I don't know how to help everything. Right. So <laughs> like that, that I just wanted to jump in on it. I think it's really important. Be uh, the best at something. Jason, you went exactly where where I wanted this question to go. It is so important. Everybody is all over the freaking place. Um, like you said, Bob, you, a jack of all trades, master at none. I promise you guys, you will get more business. You will have your phone ringing uh, more than you can answer it if you solidify yourself as great in one lane. And then once you do that, go diversify all day. Uh, Marilyn. Everybody on this panel is extremely busy. And I remember when I was young and I was coming up in the game, and even as I started to really move in the game, you know, when I would look at people like you guys, I would always think to myself, like, how can I get their attention? How can I spark up a conversation? So can you talk to anybody? And I'm sure, you know, there are people out there who are just like me, just like you guys. Uh, you know, th there's this such thing as a 90 second elevator pitch. How do you get somebody's attention in 90 seconds, 60 seconds? Like, what are some of the strategies people can work on on really being able to tell their story in a very clear, a very cohesive, concise way that would hook somebody who is as important as all of you or that are on the panel and say, you know what? I'm busy right now, but here's my card. Why don't you call my office and set up a meeting with my assistant? Marilyn, this one's for you. Okay. Um, well, this happens to me often. And I think a lot of executives may not have the time to engage with people, but I'm always like, if I'm out and about, well, I'm not out and about now because pandemic, but <laughs> usually when I'm out and about, people would normally just come up to me and have a conversation. I'm all about giving back because I started as an intern and you know, someone at Bad Boy gave me an opportunity. So I always take five minutes at least to talk to individuals about what they're trying to do. But I, um, if you're doing like, as it relates to business, when I'm, um, you know, this short brief moment in time in the summer when we got to go outside, <laughs> I literally had to pitch my wine business wherever I was at. So if I was at a restaurant, a bar or whatever, and let's say an owner or manager came over, I had, you know, it's a busy, you know, restaurants are busy. So I had maybe two minutes to pitch why they should carry my wine, right? So I always um, tell other entrepreneurs, you know, you start with a what um, and how you're going to do it and a why and why the, why are you doing what you're doing? And I think being, um, understanding those three concepts and being able to kind of tell another entrepreneur, a restaurant person, a uh, bar manager or whoever the beverage manager is and sell them in. And then I back it up really quickly with videos and photos of the brand. Um, and honestly, that has amounted to sales and to a lot of um, on-premise accounts for me, off-premise accounts. Even if I walk into a random liquor store, I have about two minutes to pitch my brand. Um, but I tell them, you know, what I sell, you know, how I sell it and what, what makes me different from any other wine brand and why I do it. And I think people love hearing the why of why anyone is in business. I think that's a, um, a really important thing from consumers to other businesses. Um, and uh, it, it helps me greatly. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, appreciate Sean, it. Go ahead. Can I, Bob? Can I real quick? Yeah, I wanted to say Please. a couple of things real quick. So one of the ways uh, I always tell young people uh, when they're trying to connect with, you know, someone like us on the panel or someone, uh, you know, in, in a certain position, I say, one, think about being politely persistent, right? Which is, you know, reaching out, following up. Don't don't be, you know, uh, uh, a kind of a jerk where, where, you know, somebody, you know, you reach out to somebody on Monday and then you, 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 you reach out to them on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That's not the way it's, it's, it's going to work. Or you know, you're upset, like, oh, the person never reached out back to me. I think you should be politely persistent, understand that everybody's working, uh, everybody's busy. But over time, you know, especially now, and it's kind of difficult now because of the pandemic, because when all of us on this panel know, you know, we had conventions and parties and all these different things where we can network with other people in the business. It's a little bit difficult now. So you, you got to use social media and you got to be politely persistent. Um, the other thing too is that understand that there are going to be some people in this business 
in this world who are just basically assholes. I mean, it's simple as that, right? There are going to be some people who are in positions of power. They somehow forgot that, you know, where they were when they started. They just thought that all of a sudden they just woke up one day and they were the head of this company and that company and, and, and they're assholes. So the lesson to a lot of you who are, you know, on this panel and then one day you're going to be in a position of power, don't be an asshole, right? Uh, and I know that you guys are in the UK, so let me say it in the UK way. Don't be a wanker, okay? Don't be a wanker and treat people <laughs> that are trying to get on in a very negative way, right? And the last thing I would say is if you're trying to approach folks for an opportunity, it's best to be able to say to them, this is what I can offer you. Find out what that person may need an offer to fulfill that need, as opposed to saying, hey, I just want this and I just want that. Give me this, give me that. Start off by saying, hey, here's something that I can offer you. I've noticed that your, you know, your business does A, B, C, and D. Hey, I think that I can help you with, you know, with B or C. I think if you, if you uh, approach it that way, I think uh, you might find it to be a lot more helpful and much more beneficial in what you're trying to do. Friends, I want to. I got to jump in. I got to tell a quick story. How got, I got to move this on, Jay. Quick, so make quick, it quick, quick. This quick be story. The quick story. Ever. So I met. I met the CFO of Bad Boy my sophomore year of college. Um, I met him. I would email him every couple of months to to tell him about the how I was following the industry when Bad Boy made news. Every just to let him know that I was still interested. He never wrote me back. Not one time. My senior year, so two years later, I wrote him, said, oh, I, I got an internship at Columbia Records. I go up to New York. I, I, you know, I would love to, if I could ever meet him again. He finally wrote back and said, can you come to the office tomorrow? I went to the office and he was like, yeah, I knew you were emailing me. I just, I kept saying, I got to write you back. I never had time. I'm glad you're here though. Let me walk you around the building. The woman he introduced me with left. After she, after I met her, like left the company, nothing. So come to find out, I, I called back to say, hey, you know, I met with people. I thought I might get an internship there. Is that still possible? A woman hired me because she thought I was related to him somehow because he walked me around. Mind you, persistence. But I was persistent and I kept showing that I was paying attention to his industry, his job, his stuff. Not talking about myself. Not going, hey, this is what I'm doing. Just letting him know that I cared, ideas I had, all this stuff. And he finally invited me in. Like you have to, like Bob said, be persistent and, and be respectful. Like people are watching while you're doing what you're doing, even though they might not respond. Don't take it personal. It's not personal. It's not an attack on you. But you need to always know that people are paying attention to your character, who you are, how you write the language that you're using, the information that you're presenting, and that is making a determination on how they're going to treat you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, you know, I know this is you guys' panel and I'm looking to you guys to give advice, but I want to just chime in for one thing um, here. I'll tell you, and I believe all of you guys alluded to this. I know what it is like to try to get people's attention, especially when I was nobody in the industry um, and in business. And I know what it is now for people to try to get my attention. And I can tell you guys, anybody who is watching this panel, the worst thing you could ever say, say you do get me in an elevator and it's just me and you. And I ask you, well, what do you do? What would you like to do for me? I'll do anything. I, I just want to get, I, do, I don't know what anything means. That's what Jason was saying earlier. That is the worst thing. Do your homework on the individual. Do your homework on the business and be able to come with very, very specifics in terms of what value you can bring to that organization or to that person. That is what intrigues people. That is what, if you say, look, I know your organization. I know your history. And if I could come in as an intern, an assistant, any low level, this is what I can bring to the table. That's what's going to make me say, okay, I need to, to have a further conversation with you because we're all looking to continue to grow. 
And there's, we don't know everything. So if you can bring value to the table or area that we're not currently uh, uh, doing well in, trust me when I tell you, it doesn't matter if you have a name in the game yet. It doesn't matter if you have history. If you can bring value, it is going to make anybody on this panel say, let me have a longer and deeper conversation with you at another time. Just, I know we're short on time, so I'm going to throw this back to you, Jason. And again, for our panelists, let's keep it short and sweet, but very, very detailed. Jason, how many businesses have you started yet? Uh, two. Okay. Uh, so, so, so good. That's what I thought. You know, I, I, I say this often, and I think it's very, very important for us. People look at you guys. You guys are successful. They think that you guys just made it. You woke up one day and you were just Jason Wiley sitting on the Ultimate Seminars panel. They, they think that, hey, you, you're Bob Celestin or Marilyn Van Alstyne, and, you know, you guys just made it. It doesn't work like that. So, so Jason, number one, can you talk to us? Failure is part of the process. Every idea is not a good idea. Nope. So there are going to be ideas that you attempt. And, you know, we often hear you, you got to thug it out. You got to stay the course. When should somebody look themselves in the mirror and understand as much as I love this idea, it just ain't working. And, and that whole stay the course thing and never give up and all of that crap. Some ideas just ain't it. Some businesses just ain't it. And let me learn from it because failure is part of the process and apply it somewhere else. So one thing I think we got to go full circle back is about your network, right? You have to have a, a basically a board of directors, confidants, people that you can talk to about what's going on in your business and your world, right? One thing that hasn't been mentioned is Prez is quick to tell you that's not it. Right. So you you call Prez, you talking to him and you you're going through what's going on. Things are like I've caught this is a real conversation. I'm like, man, this is not really going on. This is not happening. Like, I'm not sure how to do this. He's in Prez go probably because that's not it. Like you I mean, you just that's not going to make it right. But I have a network of people around me who I can go to talk to who have been in positions that I want to be in, who want to be in kind of positions that I'm in, this group of, of friends, associates, family that I have that I uh, they understand and they are gonna give me real advice, right? They're gonna, I, I, I bounce things off of them. You have to look at yourself and be honest, right? Like Marilyn talked about, these tears aren't gonna pay my bills. Like if you, you gotta pay bills. And so if whatever that idea is, is still going and it's no money is coming in, at some point you have to be honest and say, this isn't it. Like I can't survive off of this. I have to figure out the pivot, figure out the thing. Also, you have to be uh, honest about your audience, whatever the audience is of your business, your product. If they're not receptive to that idea, you're not going to change an audience. You have to change to meet that audience. So you have to do your research and understanding of your audience. You have to have a network around you that you can be honest with and who will be honest with you. And you also have to be responsible for your expenses, your business, the cost of things, and be really honest about if this can meet those, those needs. Thank you, Jason. And, and that's really, really great advice. Um, Bob, I want to move it over to you. You have worked with some of the most successful artists in music history. Uh, can you talk to us, whether it be artistry or just uh, entrepreneurs and successful people in general, what are some common traits that they all have in common? If somebody's sitting on the other side of this panel right now, if they had to do a, a self-evaluation checklist on what it is that makes successful people successful. What are some of the things that they should be looking for in themselves? Number one, first of all, do you have the talent, right? Now, it's not just necessarily as an artist, but in whatever you're trying to do. Uh, if you're trying to be an entrepreneur, do you have the knowledge base? Have you educated yourself or have you built a foundation of information and knowledge? Um, and, and, and like Jason and, uh, Marilyn will say, also have a team of people around you that will help you 
so you can develop some sort of core competency in whatever it is you're trying to do. If, if you're talking about artists, I always have to tell artists, even though this is a hard question for them to, to answer, is like, do you really believe you're talented? Like, do you really truly believe you're talented, right? Whether if you're a singer, do you, do you can you really sing? Are you a rapper? Can you really rap? Are you a producer? Can you really produce? Like, sometimes you gotta look in the mirror and ask that question, right? And, and be honest. And sometimes it's hard. The third, the, the third thing is, okay, let's say you got the talent, you got the, 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 uh, the, the competency, what is your work ethic like, right? There's a lot of people that have a lot of talent. Um, you know, they have a certain amount of core competency. They, they've got a certain level of education. They don't want to work hard. And what sacrifices are you willing to make, right? Those are the two most important things. Because sometimes you could have a little bit of talent, but your work ethic is so crazy that at the end of the day, it'll make up for what you, you, you're, you're lacking in other areas. And when I'm representing, let's say, artist managers or even production companies, and they're looking to sign an artist and they come to my office and they say, yeah, you know, I, I got this money and I'm going to invest in this artist. And we start talking. They'll say, yeah, you know, I had to I had to wake the artist up the other day to go to this recording studio, to remind them to go to the recording studio. Or the artist came to the recording studio um, and the artist wasn't prepared. Or, um, you know, we had... Um, uh, 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 an interview set up at seven o'clock in the morning with this, you know, overseas uh, internet uh, press or whatever, and the artist didn't didn't wake up. Well, I really tell my clients, I'm like, listen, I don't really think that it's worth your while to spend the money that you're going to spend on this artist if you have to tell them or remind them to go to the studio and be prepared. If you have to go and remind them to wake up to uh, you know, be ready to do a, 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 a press interview. That's not the artist, in my opinion, you need to be investing all this money in, right? When this happens consistently, it's, it's not a good look. So, and that's even with individuals. You got a, a, an employee that you're trying to hire. They always come in late. They always got an excuse. You know, they want to leave at, at, at uh, you know, five four forty five. they're out, 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 out the door. You can't call them after five o'clock, six o'clock, ask them to do something. Oh, no, I, I, no, I, 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 my, my job day, day is over. Those are not the kind of individuals you want around you. Those are not the kind of people you want to hire. So if you don't have the work ethic and the willing to make the sacrifice, what does that mean? Hey, you know what? I can't go out, you know, hang out with, with, with my boys or with my girls because I got to get something done. Um, you know, if it's your girlfriend and boyfriend, they can't understand that you, the level of sacrifice you have to will be willing to make to become great then you're, this is not for you. Like, you know, like, I don't know, it was the thing was Biggie said, don't be mad, UPS is hiring. You know, stick stick with your day job because you don't have what it takes to really, really come out here and be great. Thank you, Marilyn. You, we all work side by side along with for Sean Diddy Combs uh, from the very early years. One of the things that I always admired about him was his ability to listen to all of us, but he made the final decision. And when he made that decision, there were many days I could say, I didn't agree with his decision. I didn't see it. I didn't understand why he was making the decision that he made, but being somebody who was loyal, somebody who was down with the camp, I went along with it and more times than not, it proved to be right. It was the right decision. Even if I couldn't see it, in real time. So can you talk to somebody out there right now, the importance of decision making you as a CEO, you as somebody who now works for yourself, have people working for you, the buck stops with you. They're looking to you to give them direction. You're the general, they're the soldiers. Talk to us about being either quick or slow to make a decision and then standing by that decision, even when nobody sees it but you? Um, yeah, so, well, my decision-making has been pretty quick during a pandemic, um, just because the way I, my culture of my business is, I operate more like a speedboat. It's all about where you're at in your business, you know? So I pivot rather quickly when things are happening in the culture and trends. Um, 
but when I do make a decision there, sometimes my team doesn't see why I'm making that decision either. And that's okay. <laughs> um, but I do believe that it's important for you to go with your gut. I think the one thing that we definitely picked up working with um, Sean is um, listening to your gut, listening to your intuition and kind of we picked up all this experience. So there's some things that I can see. I can see a play from a mile away that my team might not necessarily see just because of the experience level or they just never have been put in that predicament for whatever reason, but I can see it a mile away. So I may say, nope, we're going left. And they be like, no, the best way is to the right. I'm like, nope, we're going left. <laughs> and my home team, my whole team will go left with me. And then they see it at the end, like, oh, okay, this made a lot of sense. And then I'm better, I'm able to explain it better at, at the tail end of I'll go like, okay, this is why I went left instead of going right. All those companies went right. We went over here because I knew that this was where the win was. Um, so I think that, you know, there are some things in business that you do take a slow time. You, you, you know, you want to sleep on it, digest on it a couple of days to think about where the, the major parts of your business, but there are some things that you have to, you have to, a, make the decision because you are the person in charge. Um, that comes with a whole lofty weight. And um, you have to listen to your gut. Thank you. Jason, you being the CEO of your company, you have people who work for you. I don't think, and I want you to talk directly to people who are working for someone right now. I don't think people understand that the boss wants you to step up. Yes, I want you to work within the confines of your of, of, of the culture of our company, but any boss wants you to step up, do more than is in your job description, play outside of the confines of your job description. Can you talk to someone who, who, who is sitting and they're working for somebody? And Bob, I love that you, you talked about this in detail earlier. There are so many people who are by 445, they're ready to clock out. They will not work one minute over 5 p.m. because they look at it like I'm not getting paid for that. Jason, just bringing it back to you, you being an employee once uh, uh, and you having to step up and go outside of the confines of your job description, and now you being a, a CEO, and and what it is that that makes employees stand out to you? People are always upset about like promotion time, right? And and why I didn't get promoted and. Things that you have to look at within is yourself. What have you been doing? What are you doing to, to separate yourself? How are you doing the things that you need to do in order to be uh, to be ahead of the rest of your group? And how do you do those things? And so you are constantly needing to showcase your abilities, your thought process, how you operate, how you move. Present me with information. Give me things, ideas that I'm not thinking of. Show me ways that we could be better as a company. How are we going to grow? What are opportunities out there that you're seeing that I'm not seeing? I know that I don't see everything. That's the great thing about a leader. A leader understands that they don't see everything and they hire people around them to help them through those things. The one thing we all got at Bad Boy was that I our, the leader of the company, he wanted everyone in their role to do what they could to be the best they could because he wanted the best information. You want to get the best information. I want TID to be the best agency out there. And I know I need my employees to help me to do that. So I'm asking them, what do you think? Where should we go? What are we not doing? Where are opportunities? And the people who step up and say, I got the answer. Those are the people who shine for me. The people who come to work and say, here's an opportunity I was thinking about. I think we should do it. Now, sometimes I might shut them down. Like, nah, that ain't it. But but I also times I'm like, yes, let's do that. That's going to put us way ahead. And, you know, and, and a person can't. It's not it, it is. I have to stress this all times. It's not personal. Just because I say no tomorrow doesn't mean the next day I'm not going to say yes. Don't take it personal. Uh, I know it's just an opportunity for a yes. Like if you really about this, if you really want to move forward, when you get that no, oh, let me think why that no came. 
Oh, I see why. Let me hear. Let me switch this up here. This is what I was thinking. Oh, this is something else for you. And then you go and you move forward. And I'm looking at you like, oh, yeah, I love this. This is this is the type of employee I want to keep moving in my company. And I don't want them to go anywhere else but to be here. Thank you, Jason. Uh, you, you know, and, and, and shout out to, to so many of you guys who are leaving questions in the chat and, and, I'm, and I'm reading as we're going along. I, I, I want to take one and I want to I want to go. And this comes directly from what you were just saying, Jason. Uh, so I'm going to throw it right back to you, Jay. Jane S. Jane S. just asked a really, really dope question in the chat. Um, she says, how do how should she navigate or anyone navigate going above and beyond on their job without stepping out of line or stepping on their manager's toes? Well, I mean, here, here's the thing about it, right? We you first understand the culture of where you work and what's going on with the things that you got going on. So you you take that opportunity, right? You understand the culture that you're in. And you present information and facts and opportunities, right? It's the way, one, that you research and gather the information, right? If you're, if you're going about just presenting ideas without any resources or background information on it, then you, you, you're just throwing things at a dartboard. And I don't really have time for that. So the research, two, is stepping up and presenting it in a way that you know would be receptive, right? We all, in, we all present to people, to our clients, to, to future clients. So you always have to present in the way that people are gonna be receptive to that information. If I'm going to a meeting with HBO, if I'm going to a meeting with AT&T, if I'm going to a meeting with Toyota, if I'm going to a meeting with a record label, I can't go to that meeting with the same way of, of, of my presentation, my talk, my delivery, because they, they're not going to receive the information the same. So you have to make sure that you're presenting it to your, your line of command, whatever that is, the supervisor that you have, or however you're, you're going to present the information so that they are receptive to it. Uh, three, you always have to remember to be respectful in it, right? You, I can't go to a meeting and say, well, you've been presenting some dumb ideas, so I thought this would be better. We not going to move forward. At that moment in time, this whatever conversation you had to present to me is, is done. Your manager is done with you. Like you're no, you're not going to go any further. Like you have to realize how you are respectful to others in your presentation. If you think something hasn't been done right, you don't go and your first words come out. Your, this has been done wrong. This is stupid. I got something better. You, you're not going to move forward that way. So you have to be cognizant of your research, of your presentation and of your delivery to make sure that you're not stepping on people's toes and that you're not going to be offensive to others and hurt your career. Thank you, Jay. Um, guys, we're down to the 10 minute mark. So really let's keep our answers brief. I want to get as much information in this next 10 minutes as humanly possible. We got another question from Charlotte. Um, Charlotte Dale, it looks like. Bob, this is for you. She asks, is there a place uh, is there a place for British professionals within the American music companies? And if so, how do you think they can convey their knowledge and experience um, when there's so many differences between the Brits and American industry? Well, I mean, the, I, I know a lot of uh, British folks that are in the music industry right now. I don't necessarily think, and there isn't that much of a difference, you know, from a music in the music business between the American music business and the British music business. I mean, we're, we're like kissing cousins for the most part. I think ultimately at the end of the day, you know, you've got to make a decision as to if you, if you're looking at a particular record label or, you know, management company or whatever the case may be, you know, obviously try to reach out, um, you know, see if they're looking to hire, obviously if your resume is, is really, uh, you know, top notch, then you're probably going to get a lot of consideration. Also, the other, at the end of the day, what I found was interesting was that depending on where in the record label you're trying to get in, if you're trying to get into marketing and promotion, your ability to say, hey, I can help you market and promote this project, you know, in Europe or in the UK, I think it's something that could be very beneficial also. It all depends on what you're bringing to, 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 the, to the party, so to speak, right? So figure out what it is that you want to do and figure out if your skill set 
would fulfill the needs of uh, 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 the music industry and, and take it from there. Again, be politely persistent, see if you can find um, some mentors. Um, uh, if there's any sort of internship opportunities that are available, again, we're in the middle of a pandemic, so got to see how that plays out. It may, it may even be a virtual uh, uh, internship. Um, take a look at all those opportunities. Um, but there are a lot of folks from other countries in the music industry, uh, especially those from the UK. Thank you, Bob. Marilyn, uh, we got another Zoom user, uh, didn't leave their name, but they got an interesting question I want to throw one over to you. Uh, it says, how do you balance private, non-music related relationships, whether um, non-music related relationships, mental health and entrepreneurship? Okay. Um, well, I'm just gonna speak from the, because the, most of my relationships are derived from not music. Um, so um, I guess what I like to tell people is, you know, with, as far as being an entrepreneur, it is a um, thing on your mental health. It does a, a little thing to your mental health and you kind of, cause you constantly hear no. And if you're not ready to hear no 82 times a day, this is probably not the best profession for you. Um, but know that when you do hear 82 times, it, the 83rd time is probably going to be a yes. Um, so you have to kind of get back up and um, keep pushing forward. So I guess you just have to have, uh, you have to be relentless, I kind of, um, in what you do day to day. Um, there are days that you're going to have bad days where, you know, things are happening in your supply chain that are uncontrollable. Like this summer, I went through a huge like customs issue where it held up my inventory for more than a month, which caused issues on our US side and as it relates to sales, key sales were key sales opportunities were missed. Um, so there are gonna be days where you're just like going through it and you just kind of gotta shut down. That's that's just my advice. I I close the computer, I walk away, I <laughs> take some time off and I come back tomorrow morning and you know refreshed um I've, I've slept on it i might have a new way of combating whatever issue or a new way of um dealing with whatever challenge i may be um i may be having at the moment um but i think that it's important to take time to yourself and kind of recalibrate so that you can come back refreshed new and um ready to start the new day thank you marilyn Two last questions before we close out. Bob, I'm swinging it back your way. I got a question from Zoe. She says, hey, Bob, do you recommend managers, artists, uh, managers, artists, music entrepreneurs who are not practicing attorneys learn at least the basics of, the in of entertainment law? And what kind of resources um, can one use to learn? Okay, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if you're gonna be a manager, and you're managing the career of recording artists or you're trying to set up a production company, it would absolutely positively uh, behoove you to understand some aspects of the legal and business uh, uh, foundations of the music industry. Um, and the way you do that is um, there's a lot of great YouTube tutorials. You can go to my website. I have a lot of articles that I've written in the past. Um, I actually have an online course that I'm gonna be making available. I'll let Kwame know about it when it's ready. Um, there's a great book called You Need to Know About the Music Business by uh, an attorney named Don Passman um, that I think is a good foundation um, to the extent that you can get Billboard magazine or the equivalent in the UK of Billboard magazine. Um, it's very, very important for you to understand what's going on with streaming, for example. Um, publishing is a very important part uh, of the music business. So, you know, as with anything, if you're going to be a manager, what does that mean? You're advising and you're counseling an artist uh, as far as the direction of their career. You have to absolutely know some parts uh, of, uh, not some parts, but a lot, a big part of the, the business and the legal foundation of the music industry. It's absolutely imperative. You can't say I'm gonna be a, you know, I'm gonna be a manager and not have a general understanding of what it is to sign a recording contract. What is an advance? What are the royalties? What is publishing, right? Very, very important that you understand that. Obviously, if you can find an attorney that uh, you can you can hire or even develop a relationship with that you can call from time to time to give you some information, that would also be a very good thing. I think in the UK they're called 
either barristers or solicitors. I forget what the difference between the two of them are, but um, it's the equivalent of the attorney here in the United States. All right. So again, absolutely important that you have a foundation and understanding. You don't have to necessarily be a super duper expert in everything a contract says or anything like that, but it's going to be important for you to have a foundation about what the music business is about. Thank you, Bob. Jason, you got the last question before we close out and we will open it up to the audience. Um, beyond that, the audience will ask you guys questions directly. Uh, so for you, Jason, I know you have uh, uh, an extremely successful agency. You know, whether it is getting clients based on your agency or it is someone in a music industry management out there trying to get the attention of a and how, what is the best ways, in your opinion, to, um, to get new business, get new clients, uh, and then sustain it? And lastly, and, and this is something that I think is extremely important, especially for people who are on the music industry side and not just entrepreneurs, uh, the dangers of taking business personal, because business is not personal. They are two very, very different things. Never take business personal. So can you answer the first part about uh, of the question, which is what's the best way of going about getting new clients and sustaining them and then talk about the dangers of taking business personal? So I'll say the one of the, the best ways, and I'm, I'm going to kind of combine these two, one of the best ways to really um, get new business and to, to make it sustainable is to make it personal for yourself in the sense that you do research to understand what people need and what they want. And so like, if you're a manager of artists, you can't go to artists and talk about other clients. Like, yo, I managed this other guy and, and I managed this right. one artist and she sings like this and she's amazing and she's dope and I can be your manager. I don't want to hear that. I want you to tell me why you're going to do stuff for me and make me important and make me stand out and make me feel important and make my music blast and make, make help me. So you have to do the research as to the things that that artist needs from you in order to be successful. And you have to go to that meeting and provide them with that information. I know for a fact that you're looking to get your music on these streaming platforms that you've been unable to get there. And I can get you to those platforms. I know that the editor of Rap Radar, and I can work hard to get you into positions at Spotify if you wanted to get onto that kind of thing. I am really good friends with X, Y, and Z at this liquor company that's looking for a, a artist like yourself to be in front. These are the things that I would do for you and you only because I want to make your career grow because I love your music. This is when I listen to your music. This is the audience that you have. Now you making me feel good. Now I feel like you really have done the research and the time and understand who I I am. And now I want to work with you as a manager of me. And that goes for anybody in any kind of pitching. You have to go into that meeting, understanding what that person, what that business, what that entity needs and how they're going to be successful and how you're going to provide that for them. And so you take it personal and do that research and do it and understand that once you put it all out there on the on the table, like there no their response has nothing personally to do with you. Unless you slap their mother or something, or you ran over their dog, it is not a personal conversation. This is the business. And for whatever reason, I chose somebody else. So you know what? Sometimes you can go back to people and say, hey, I just want to do some more research. Like, why did you choose the other company, if, if you don't mind telling me that? Because I would love to be better at it. You know, humble yourself and ask for why somebody else got the job. I know I've done that a few times in order to get further business from other people to understand where I lacked the things that I needed to have in order to be successful. You know, you have to understand that nothing about business is a personal attack on you, but it is an opportunity for you to learn, understand, and to do research and grow. And so you have to take it personal in that you really want it and you're going to make sure you're going to do everything possible in order to achieve it. But when a no comes your way, that is nothing personal about you. That is just about that situation that you presented. And there might be other opportunities to get business that you just didn't think of with that company before. So when you put your best foot forward, I've had people tell me no about a pitch and come back to me and say, you know what? I, I was thinking about your company to do X, Y, and Z because you guys came here so prepared. And I think we can do business in this kind of way. So don't think a no is a personal attack on you. It is just about that situation. 
Thanks, Jay. Uh, I have enjoyed this last hour so much. Please, guys, wherever you are in the world, uh, you know, first, I want to just thank you guys, Kwame, Nikki, Andrea, for having us. Uh, hopefully, we have brought some really great information from the other side of the pond to you guys in the UK. Uh, if you love conversations like this, if you really are into music and entrepreneurship, please follow me across all platforms. Again, my name is Sean Prez, and across all platforms, you can find me at Power Moves Prez. It's like the shirt says, Power Moves, um, or on YouTube, same thing, Power Moves Prez or Power Move Maker. I want to send a big shout out to um, Trent Rama. Trent, what up, brother? Um, you know, thank you so much for connecting me with Kwame and Nikki and, and Andrea and, and allowing us to bring our knowledge and experience to you guys over there in the UK. And, you know, this is back to you, Kwame. It's back to you, Andrea, Nikki. You guys can jump in and just let us know how you want us to move forward with uh, allowing the audience to ask our panelists um, some other questions.